All right, so um, my name is Chris, and today I'm going to talk to you about mythical creatures. So let me start with Hibi dragons. Hibi dragons is a phrase that you use when you mark, want to mark something on the map, but you don't know what's there. It's a part of the map that's unexplored, part of the map that you don't know anything about. It doesn't actually appear in the very old maps. The phrase that they used was Hibi lions, because they thought lions were mythical creatures. Now we know they don't. But dragons, they are still kind of icky. But this phrase is, um, actually appears on, on one uh, old item, which is the Hun Lennox globe. It has this inscription in Latin, Hirsung Dragones, which means heavy dragons. I want you to keep this in mind for a second while I talk about another scary thing, which are layoffs. Yeah, the big thing about our industry are layoffs of this and last year. But with every single end comes a new beginning, which are basically recruitments. And with every recruitment, we get the same talk with the same questions. So we usually ask things that are supposed to show that we care about the projects, like which Rails version are you using right now? If it's seven, it's great. If it's six, it's OK. If it's five, it's kind of scary. But if it's four, you want to ask for some extra money. If you are front-end inclined, you might also ask, do you use React, perhaps TypeScript? which is, well, very trendy up until yesterday. Um, how do you manage state on the front end? Or perhaps front end isn't your thing, and they will probably ask about things about process, continuous integration, continuous deployment. Or the very trendy topic today on about testing. Perhaps they have mutation testing on something. Yeah, that's, these are all cool. But the problem starts when you ask about the database. Yeah, you ask, tell me about, about the database, and the other guy says, I think it's Postgres, which version I'm not entirely sure. I have to check. Most of the real shop talk that we do is about, data, it's about storing and manipulating data, and that's precisely what the database does. If you don't believe in Elastical Got Rails, here is an extremely simplified schema of how the typical Rails application looks like. And you can divide it into three parts. The part that the user cares about, which is front-end. The part that we care about, because it has the most boxes. There's the Ruby part. And there's the part that does most of the work. Still don't believe me? There is this concept called test pyramid, which is the ideal split on how you should test things in your database. If you Google it, it looks kind of like this. Um, so you have uh, a lot of unit tests at the bottom some integration tests to test things um, working with other things, and you sprinkle a little bit of end-to-end -end testing, end -to -end just, testing to just to show that the show business, business actually works. works. This is not how the typical split in the Rails uh, application looks like. The typical split is more like this. You can test some stuff using unit tests. You test more stuff with end-to-end, -end, if there are any, because you want to make sure that the business actually makes sense. But most of the tests we put into integration testing. And what do we integrate with? The database. Rails has a weird relationship with, a database, with data databases. Most Rails applications are pretty useless without the database. They are made as a point of contact, point of interaction with databases. And yet we treat those like mythical creatures, basically here be dragons. I'd like to talk about how to handle those mythical creatures, how to make them more familiar. So handling mythical creatures first requires you to admit that databases are very weird. They are not object-oriented. They are not even functional. Most of them use declarative languages. They are not aware of any of your precious abstractions. They are usually used to connect with one user that has access to all the tables. But they have a redeeming quality. They are very, very fast at processing data. Let's start with a small one. This is um, SQLite, generated by Midjourney. And SQLite has a particular use case that we all know. This is, I made this, ta this site in my free time. I'd like to show it to the world, but I don't really feel like setting up a database server. And if you look at the documentation of SQLite, it kind of goes, wait, it isn't. It isn't for small sites. They use SQLite themselves, and they have 20 million queries a day on a VM shared with 23 other applications on a seven-year-old hardware, which is basically Skylake, which is a crappy processor. 
So they handle all this data, and now you know that the Clark Kent of Esculite takes off his glasses and is actually Superman. That is amazing. Esculite has extremely fast reads, only single thread writes though. It's a public domain code, it's not even GPL, it's, it's a level above that and has very easy backups, because if you can copy a file, you can back it up. But these are like marketing points. The real points, the real benefits for us developers is I can handle a lot of traffic on a free tier hosting, and uh, I can embed this into anything I want. I can make an Android library, I can make a gem that will use SQLite, like it's nothing because it's public domain. And also, if you think about easy backups, backups are also very useful for testing because if you can copy the data five times quickly, then you have five environments to parallel testing, which is amazing, to be honest. It has some downsides, like um, you might want to use processes instead of threads for your servers because it um, uses a lock while querying. Because there is only a single writer, you might find some retries useful if you have uh, long-running insert queries. And there is no built-in full-text search, which is a very popular feature which is missing, and uh, there are ways around it. But if you are going into those, you might as well consider the elephant in the room, which is Postgres. Postgres is super versatile. It's probably one of the best open source projects ever. It can replace your stack, basically. Yes, all of it. There's an article by Stefan Schmidt. Um, the blog is called Amazing CTO. It exploded some time ago. It uh, basically shows you that you can use Postgres for everything. It can be a cache. It can be a message queue. It can do GraphQL. You can basically replace any single part of your stack and just use Postgres. You don't really want to do this in most cases, but uh, there are some features there which you might want to consider. For example, the cache feature. It looks like this. This is a basically um, unlock table. What it means is that the table won't have a write head log, which is what stores the data on the disk. So this is basically, at least most of it, in memory. This is cool, yeah. You can use it in Rails. I think Rails 6, there is a helper in, in migrations, which is also cool. But you say probably, I already have Redis. Why do I need this for? OK, consider this use case. Attach this to your RSpec config so it will create unlocked tables instead of the real ones on CI. And if you test write a lot of data, you get a very nice speed improvement. On the terrible projects, it was like three minutes. On a decent one, it was still 20 seconds. Holy shit, this is amazing. This is something that we can actually use from the hidden database features. Is there more cool stuff that we could use? Well, let's check it out. This is a Postgres documentation because we only care about the, well, hidden stuff. We go for advanced features. And in my humble opinion, if you click it, the fun begins here. Who has used a window function before? At least some guys. Yeah, cool. Um, so window functions are basically per row calculations on your queries. They are mostly misunderstood, but they are freakishly powerful. Some examples that I extracted from various projects as a, let's say, employee salary against department average. Most people would do it in two queries and combine the data in Postgres, but yet you can do this with a window function, which is basically this over part over there, which will tell that the aggregate will be distributed or partitioned by department. And yeah, you say, too much SQL, we need some Ruby. You can do this in Ruby, you don't need anything other than active record, and it, it's perfectly readable to other Ruby developers. Let's try the other one, cheapest product per category. Very useful if you want to upsell something in e-commerce. We can use pattern matching, yes, like in Ruby or Elixir. We assign the row number to every single um, category, order them by price and name, in a subquery, then you pattern match it to products. Really cool. And again, you can do this in Ruby. You don't really need to write this huge SQL so other people will be scared of. This is just active record. No gems, no extra stuff. Let's try the last one, the cumulative sum, which is like the one of the most Google things in SQL on Stack Overflow. Um, I extracted some part of it, so you can use composition, which is really nice. And uh, 
the bottom part feels kind of like English, right? There's this, this aggregate function, this sum that is ordered by month, ascending rows between unbound and preceding and current row. It isn't, these are all keywords. Um, so many keywords in a row might, well, be a little bit tricky. But still, you'll get a cumulative sum in one query. And still, you can do it in Active Record. You don't need to write everything in pure SQL, which is really fun. Looks a little bit weird to some Ruby devs, but uh, it's very, very fast, and you can encapsulate it. And why is it fast? Let me explain. Explain is a feature of database that most people have heard of, but most people can't really read it, at least not all of it. It contains a hidden feature. Postgres keeps a statistics on all the data, so we can estimate the number of rows for a query. And also, there is an explain helper in Active Record, but uh, it's kind of bad because it doesn't support any flags for extra features. So please use uh, explain your scope to SQL. Um, let's take a look at the non-trivial but kind of easy query, which is uh, select some users and then join some notifications and filter both of those because we filter on joining and we filter on users created at. If you do the simplest explain you can have, disabling even the default flags, which are costs in the current version of Postgres, you get this kind of output. And what you see right now are the list of strategies uh, not list, a tree of strategies, which will be composed into a final result. Every single arrow is a strategy. You can look them up in the documentation, what the strategy is and what it's doing. Like sequential scan is basically just iterating on stuff and hash is building a hash. And uh, this tree will get uh, uh, composed into a result set. If you add, uh, if you enable cost, you get some extra data. And the first row of those contained this estimation, which I talk about, and I extracted a gem out of it, which is a shameless plug, sorry. Let me hide it. Um, yeah, so you get those parents with some numbers in them, and these are kind of difficult to read because people think these are ranges. ranges. They are not. Yeah, no. The first one is the cost of the first row. So if you add limit one, this is the cost that it will take to, to do this query. The second is the cost to get all rows in this strategy. The next one is estimate number of rows, and the last one is row, in, row size in bytes. Okay. So what you can see is that some strategies can in execute immediately, like sequential scan can start immediately because it's just reading the table. But some of them will have to wait. Like to build this hash, we need to get all the items for this hash. And for the top one, hash join, we have to wait until both of those can produce some meaningful results. It doesn't start to stream results immediately. OK. We can also run this query by adding a flag called analyze. And if you want to run analyze with insert, update, or delete, you just run it in transaction and roll it back. Please don't run it in, in, without transaction, because you'll basically create, update, or delete a lot, a lot of rows. So you get two extra things. There is a planning time, execution time at the bottom, and there is a second set of numbers, which is the time to first row, time to all rows, the number of rows, and numbers time this strategy ran. And as you can see in the query, sometimes the, um, the numbers would be very different from um, um, the estimates, because estimates are basically just estimates. So sequential scan actually takes some time to read the data from the disk. It's not happening immediately. Still, the estimate for the number of rows is pretty close, and this is the reason why you can use this in features like if you want to do pagination and you want to have, like, I don't know, 10 filters and you have 7,000 pages, Gmail will tell you you have about 7,000 pages. It won't give you the exact number, because counting those things will be expensive, while estimating this is very, very trivial. There are also some newer flags. This might be a default in the next version of uh, Postgres, which is called buffers. Buffers will tell you how much of the data was taken from disk and how much data was already in cache, so in memory. Um, also, because I run this after the previous one, you see that the both planning time and execution time changed. So it used to be this, now it's this. And the reason for that is that, well, some of the data is already in storage. So you want to look at buffers when you explain, 
because you might find that sometimes Postgres will cache your data. This is the very interesting part of the Postgres, and there are lots of the other flags. Uh, feel free to browse the documentation for explain. But um, this is only part of making the database work fast. The, you now know why it's slow, so we might want to introduce some index. Indexes in Postgres are funny because you can only have one per subquery. They can be used for filtering or sorting or both, but you can't use two different index, one for sorting, one for filtering. And the database is the one who decides which one to use. You can find the missing indices in Postgres using PG Hero. It's a gem, an application that will basically has a, this feature of, of trying to predict which indexes might be beneficial. But you feel free to try your own types based on cardinality and maybe try different types of indexes. You also want to delete the ones that are unused because creating them takes some time. Vacuum Analyze, we refresh the statistics table. So if you run this, then you can basically see which index is not used. And speaking of PG Hero, there is um, this algorithm that it uses to determine which indexes would be helpful. It's uh, very well known. This is a very well known document, and it shows you that it's based on cardinality, the slowest queries, which is fine, but they don't have any examples. Maybe they add some. Oh, wait, this is five years ago. Can you guys add some? That would be really helpful. There are also some index doc arts, like things that you want to try. If your users are distributed geographically across multiple continents, try all the possible combinations for latitude and longitude, because you never know which ones will be the fastest one. It depends on the distribution. Um, you might want to, if you write a very complex query for some part of the system, you might run the, want to do a dedicated part partial index, which will mark, match the where part of this query. And also, there is a feature which is kind of hidden that you can add columns which won't be used for either filtering or salting, but will still be included. So if they are included, and the query uses index, and it has all the columns it needs in this include, it won't hit the table at all. It will only use index, which is extremely fast. Postgres also has some extensions. The, probably the most well-known is uh, PostGIS, which is the geographical for geodata handling, Timescale for uh, time series handling, and Citus, which isn't as popular for some reason, but it has some decent features. It's actually a combination of various different um, extensions. Uh, columnar storage is one, distributed querying, and parallelizing the queries themselves. Um, and what does it mean? Well, columnar storage is something to do with uh, how you store the data on the disk. Instead of keeping rows, which you're supposed to fetch um, all of the data in a row, you keep columns. Yeah, columns compress. Columns can, you can do subset of columns, which is cheaper. It works very well for um, a use case when you have lots of reads, especially of multiple rows or aggregates. But it has some downside in Citus, especially these are append-only tables, but they have a really good compression. Like if you have 40 terabytes worth of data and you're keeping it on a very crappy HDD because that's the only thing that can actually store it, you can compress it down to four terabytes and run it on SSD, which is amazing. It's also very simple to use because you only append using columnar, and that's basically it. You have a columnar table in your database. It's smaller and faster for some operations. You can mix and match columnar and row partitions, which is a really nice case for, like, I have the last month of data in a row-based um, table, but the archive, the cold storage that we talked about in the previous talk, can be kept in a columnar storage, which is compressed and smaller. There are also distributed tables, uh, because a few smaller servers is, are much cheaper than a big one. You can distribute the data based on location, so the users will get the data closer to them, eliminating latency. And you can dis distribute um, the data, keeping the data that is closely related together. So the particular server will have all the data related to a particular client, for example. You pick a distribution column, which is something that will tell which partition, which, um, which basically shard to use. Uh, you can use it on every single table that is not shared between the, all the clients. 
and uh, you ma mark the shared tables as reference tables, so they get copied into every single uh, shard. How do you do them? Uh, it's easy. Distributed table, table name, and column name. And then you add another table, another table, telling them collocate based on this one. These are cool features, but there are some more exotic databases. Let's talk about future curriculum. There is Cockroach, which is a fun database, because I want to have a sharding in Postgres, but I don't want to do it myself like with Citus, and I'm kind of worried about the missile strike against my data center. This is a valid use case. This will automatically distribute your data. You can do things like um, still geographically spread out um, storage. You can do multiple different kinds of um, redistributing data with, uh, uh, based on, on how frequently it is accessed. Very cool database. There's MySQL, which you could probably get done now. Wait, MySQL? Really? It's like a default choice for the PHP devs, and it's tainted with Oracle. Yuck. It's a different database right now. It's not the same as it used to be. It's super fast because of assumptions it makes in transactions. It can operate in memory by default, which, well, speeds up the tests a lot. It used to be a joke, but right now it's a very, very serious alternative to Postgres. Then you get to the really exotic stuff, like ClickHouse. Uh, ClickHouse is a um, um, database created by Russians for Yandex. Um, the use case is um, my data team takes a coffee break every single time they run a query, but giving them big query costs a lot of money. And oh my god, these things have things like pre-aggregated, pre calculated aggregates per chunk. The description that they use in Russian is ClickHub Nietarmozit, sorry for my Russian, which means that it doesn't press the brakes. This, they, they want the ClickHouse not to be the slowest part of any system. It's not the one that you want to optimize. The, the other things are slow. And Cloudflare inserts 6 million requests per second into it. They have a very really wonderful article about this. If you want to get even more exotic, you get NoSQL and DocumentDBs, but they are way beyond the scope of this talk, which I'm already running late, probably. So perhaps a part two of this talk is in order. But in the meantime, feel free to explore the world of fantastic databases. Thank you very much. <laughs>